Just some housekeeping for tonight. As I mentioned, it'd be much appreciated if you could keep your microphone on mute for the duration of the presentation. Feel free to keep your cameras on. There will also be an interactive component at the end uh, in regards to the casual case activity. Um, the panel session will be recorded uh, and please feel free to submit any questions for our guests through the Slido. So you can either scan this here, otherwise a link will be dropped in the chat that you can use. So a quick agenda for tonight. So we're just running through an introduction and then we'll have presentations from Baza Capital, Giant Leap and Social Ventures Australia, three very exciting partners, followed by a panel discussion where it's an opportunity to conduct a quick Q&A, uh, followed by a casual case activity, which will allow you guys to think about some of the topics that have been raised tonight. So we're very excited to announce the partner firms and guest speakers that will be joining us tonight. So from the funds management side of Impact Investing, we have Will Sandover, who is the CIO at Baza Capital, as well as Braden McCormack, who is the founder and chief strategy officer. And then on the VC and advisory side, as well as playing in the Impact Investing space, we have Charlie McDonald, who is an associate at Giant Leap, Tim Pullen and Patrick Bolin, who are both uh, impact investing analysts at Social Ventures Australia, and Lisa Fedorenko, who will be joining us um, from Albert's Impact Capital for the case part of this. Good night. Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce our first speakers for tonight, uh, Baza Capital. So I'll just stop sharing screen and allow them to get started. Thank you, everyone. Great. So just confirming that everyone can hear me. Yep. Fantastic. Thanks. Thanks, Angus, uh, for setting that up. So uh, first, just good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Braden, so the founder and chief strategy officer of Barza Capital. Um, just thank everyone for taking the time tonight. Um, hope you're well, especially if you are in Melbourne like myself. Um, so before we get going, I'll give a quick background to myself and William, um, the co-founders of Baza Capital. I'll then quickly run through uh, the funds that we have, and then Will will talk in detail to our uh, responsible investment framework, and you can um, ask some questions of him as well. Great, so we'll just probably roll to the first slide. Um, before we begin, um, we will be talking about investing and giving a few examples of investments. So um, as was mentioned earlier, general advice only um, and anything we say is not investment advice. So just to kick, um, to kick things off, so Baza Capital, we are what you would call an active equity fund manager based in Australia. So currently Melbourne and Perth at the moment. Uh, we currently manage two responsible investment funds. Uh, both with distinct strategies that I'll take you through shortly. Uh, Will and I started Baza in 2019. So really just reflecting that we are at an early stage of our, of our journey um, and with a relatively small fund size. Um, <clears throat> our core objective is to deliver financial outperformance within a strict responsible investment framework. So it's important, I guess, for us and our investors that we're just quite clear and transparent that this is um, our objective and it's what we're held, um, held up against. Also, our first and most significant cornerstone investment was from Future Super, um, a company a lot of you may know. So they're Australia's first fossil fuel free super fund. Um, it was really humbling to have their support um, and it was a really good validation um, when they went through our processes that they were um, they were happy to effectively invest in us at a very early stage. Great. So just quickly moving on to our two funds. So as mentioned, uh, there's two of them. The High Conviction Fund is a long only small cap fund targeting emerging companies on the ASX. Um, so really we're looking for companies that are in the development phase or growth mode. Uh, returns have been quite strong since inception. So um, over the last nearly two years, uh, the funds delivered 92% uh, return, which is ahead of its um, 
benchmark, which is the small ordinary accumulation index. Um, so again, just you know, making sure they're achieving our, our objective for our investors. Uh, the second fund that we have is quite a different strategy. So this one here is, I guess, more of a traditional hedge fund in that what it does, it targets um, opportunities around corporate situations. So think, um, think fundraisings, mergers, demergers, um, those style events. Um, the way we do it, we take a series of long positions, um, effectively buying um, a series of positions and then an overriding short position against the market to really just knock out uh, market risk. Um, what, that, what that allows us then to do is just to generate a positive return. So here was nearly 20% uh, for the first 12 months of operation um, with a beta close to zero, which means that we didn't move um, in sync at all with the um, with the ASX 200 or general equity markets. So again, um, meeting the uh, um, meeting the objective for our unit holders. Um, so just just quickly, just just probably to round that out. So while the so we have two funds with quite distinct strategies, um, we run them both through our responsible investment framework, which effectively removes the companies that we do not want to invest in and prioritises those that we want to invest further in, such as electrification, healthcare and renewable energy. Um, we'll take you through that more in details, but that's that's effectively, while they're two different funds, different strategies, they both get tied together with that, with that approach. So I guess this slide here, the need for responsible alternatives. Um, what we wanted to do is really just kind of explain the core of why why we kind of set up these two funds and what bars of capital um, or, or what we're trying to do with bars of capital. So um, at the moment, we saw that alternatives as an asset class um, really did oh, have the same responsible investment to it. Sorry, are we still, are we still there? Yeah, yeah, you use um, just one sec, you're right. So really, really what happens is alternatives just didn't have the same responsible investment attention as say traditional equities um, and now debt products. So what we sought to do um, was really just to understand why and to build and, and to build products that would sort that gap. So what, what we found, the key hurdle um, to why alternatives weren't better served was that it's quite hard to integrate um, You've got on one hand ESG investment decisions and and and, and processes, and then financial uh, decisions and processes, and it was hard to marry those, uh, particularly when decisions had to be made in a matter of you know sometimes minutes as opposed to days and weeks. So that really set us off down a path of understanding you know how can we improve that, and really where we invested our time and resources was kind of building our, our, our own databases um, using automation and, and kind of building our own IP um, to kind of really bridge that gap. Um, so I'll pass to Will, who will depth, um, take you through a bit more about what we do on, on, on the responsible investment side. Yeah, great. Thanks, Braden. Uh, so just the three key things we focus on, and, and it's probably um, just a good juncture here to just mention the word impact. So we certainly don't purport to be impact investors, but we can get into a discussion in the panel as to how we differentiate ourselves from, from the other panel members and, and how we do still feel that we're bringing, you know, uh, not to use the word, but, you know, some impact to the, the responsible investment space. But anyhow, to, to, to go through the three key things that we focus on is negative screens. So we've got a, a, a pretty strict and long list of things that we won't invest in, which I'll take you through. Um, but then the, the aspects which are positive. So we're very active in our investment. We don't follow uh, trends. We don't follow kind of baskets of, of stocks. We invest in our own companies. We do uh, our own due diligence um, and, and we do talk to management teams. And this allows us to really get the root, get to the root of what these companies are doing and, and what ESG credentials they have. 
as well as onto the next one, which is advocacy, as well as asking the questions that we feel need to be asked and advocating that these companies start to have better practices where relevant. This may be gender diversity on boards, it may be reducing their carbon footprint, it may be uh, better environmental protections um, for, for a big project and the like. Um, and we're, we're really looking to, to build on this advocacy aspect because um, we believe it's very powerful. Just in terms of the screens, um, so there's some, you know, I guess what you call classics here with gambling and tobacco and, and those things which are very easy to, to screen out. But we, we take this to a few extra dimensions then I would say the majority of fund managers in Australia. Um, we do not invest at all in fossil fuels, literally um, 0%. But then we also take a derivative of that. So we also then invest in companies that provide significant services to fossil fuel industries. So we have a metric of 25% of operations or revenue. We'll also look at carbon intensive industries. Now we don't line them out completely, but we want to see, for example, if it's aluminium smelting or, or something um, which does use a lot of energy or, or, or emit a lot of carbon, we want to see that they uh, have a transition plan in place and they're really looking to move on um, to, towards zero carbon um, within their industry. Um, we also look really closely at destruction of ecosystems. So when there's a mega project, whether it be infrastructure, mining and the like, we can still invest, but we need to see that they've got all their um, right environmental checks and balances. And there are some others that you can see there, but um, just in the interest of time, I'll move on. We seek investments in these various sectors. This is non-exhaustive. We'll also look, we'll bias ourselves to um, investing directly. So putting money straight onto the balance sheets of companies rather than just buying their shares on market. Um, and we've actually cycled our capital many times over since we've started, um, which means that there's a, our dollar has a multiplier effect in, in the right companies. Um, we also look um, very clearly at diversity. Just as some examples, so for every $1,000 that we invested, $210 of that went to the balance sheet of healthcare companies, so direct investment, $110 to renewable energy projects, $235 to green mining projects, and there, there, there are many more examples. And this will, of course, add to more than 1,000 because we actually have invested that $1,000 um, uh, you know, kind of uh, multiple times over. Um, and, and that really drives a, a lot of, um, you know, what we're doing on the responsible investment front. Um, we do make some donations um, out of our revenue as well. Um, you can see those organisations on the bottom right. Uh, just last slide here, I just want to give you a few examples of things that we've invested in. So Monash IVF Group, um, they are one of the global leaders in, in providing uh, assistive um, reproduction. Um, province resources, one we're really excited about, they're doing a quite audacious green hydrogen project um, uh, in the Pilbara in Western Australia. And New Energy Solar, who um, are an accumulator of US and, and Australian um, solar energy projects. Um, and that rounds out our presentation. Thank you very Thanks, much, uh, Braden and Will. Really appreciate it. I'll pass on now to Charlie from Giant Leap. Thanks so much. This is Charlie reporting from my living room in Melbourne, as I'm sure many of you are. Um, so I am going to talk about Giant Leap, but first off, um, just wanted to draw the link to Bazaar. So Gi Giant Leap is an early stage um, impact venture capital fund that is invested in a number of companies to date. And one of those companies actually is Future Super, which is a cornerstone investor in, in those funds. So amazing to see the kind of wheels turn where, where um, just to explain how that works, we've invested into the operating company, um, Future Super, which kind of manages the funds um, and uh, the, the, they have used those funds obviously to invest in Barza, or at least I think that that's how I'm imagining it works. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about myself first and then show you some things. Um, so a bit of an intro to me, I am an associate on Giant Leap. It's a relatively small team of four people. Um, it's quite typical of venture funds, but Giant Leap operates two, two venture funds, Giant Leap 1 and Giant Leap 2. Um, 
Giant Leap One is a $15 million fund uh, investing in seed and Series A stage companies. Giant Leap Two is aiming to be a $30 to $50 million fund. Um, we're raising that currently, reached first close, very exciting, um, and will be Giant Leap One's mandate, but bigger. Um, I think the last time, I, so I've been there for about three years, and the last time I spoke to the MMI cohort, um, I would have been an analyst. So I've been, I've been along the journey with MMI <laughs> in tandem with my journey in, in Giant Leap and just really love the work you do and, and the community you, you build. So um, just a shout out to all of you involved. So Giant Leap, to dive a little deeper on impact venture capital. So impact, maybe to, to um, link to Baza. So where, where Baza is investing um, from the sounds of it in, in um, kind of later stage opportunities um, in, in companies where you're kind of infusing capital into the balance sheet, um, they're looking at new projects. Giant Leap invests in companies where, at the stage where the company is the project. It's very, very early stage. Um, you know, the, it might be a little bit pre-revenue, it might be kind of first revenues, um, but it's all built on businesses that have an idea for a product that does not exist yet or hasn't scaled yet and is looking to create real um, change and reinvent industries. So how we invest is, is less for a, um, it's less for kind of stock market returns. It's less for, um, for debt, debt returns. We are investing into companies for equity and we expect to um, get our returns from investing in a number of companies. So a portfolio of companies that are all as, I'm sure everybody here has heard the, the, um, the stats around risk of, of early stage ventures. You know, I've heard seven out of 10 fail, nine out of 10 fail, you know, all, all of that. Um, it is a high risk game, bottom line. And so we invest in a, in a number of different companies that have a really high growth potential. And we expect to get a return when those companies reach the stage where they can exit and exit big um, through either a trade sale or going from kind of that, zero dollars of revenue through all the way through to IPO. So I'm now going to share some slides. Let me know if you're seeing, seeing the right thing. If you're seeing, if you're seeing my um, emails, that's definitely wrong. Um, so just to start with kind of what an impact startup is, I thought it would help to put them on this, um, on, on a bit of a chart here for everyone's understanding. It, it is an impact startup blends profit and purpose. And there is no trade-off between the two. So Giant Leap is, is built on the thesis that not only can you invest money and for both um, financial return and impact return in harmony, but in fact, startups that have a impact mission are actually... Um, fantastic financial opportunities in that they will outperform the market. And so to kind of put that into this chart's terms, when you see profit and purpose, um, impact starts are right up in that top right-hand corner. And we did a uh, scan of the market recently that suggested that 20% of Australian startups actually fit this category, would have passed our impact screen and our for-profit companies. Um, and then when you... Uh, kind of look at the spectrum of impact, um, you can forego profit in, um, in seeking purpose because for-profit business models do not solve everything. Um, that is not, not kind of, that's not what we're claiming at all. And so there's a very important role played by social enterprise and not-for-profit in solving those problems that for-profit um, startups can't solve, but just wanted to kind of place impact startups in the, in the scheme of the different types of startups that are out there. So in terms of what we look for, um, as you might've guessed, we look for a 100% impact embedded into the business model, but we do look for businesses that have, it, it, it's straight up venture capital in the sense that we are looking for commercial growth opportunities. And that means just to touch a little bit more on the, what we look for in terms of defining a 10x opportunity, because I'll go into the impact in a second. A 10x opportunity um, is businesses that are 
playing in markets where it is, the market is big enough for them to grow to something that is 10x their current size. And they have the ability to achieve that 10x growth very quickly. And so the ability to achieve that 10x growth is answered by questions of how strong is the value proposition? Are they solving a very real problem um, with a compelling uh, solution? Is, is the problem um, changing the industry? It's not just kind of improving a little bit on what exists. Is it, is it kind of upturning what exists and completely reimagining the industry? Um, and also factors like um, team and having the right experience and skills and resilience to build the business kind of feed this conviction on can the uh, business grow to 10x its size in the time frame required by the fund. But we look at the world through an impact lens. And so we do look at all of the opportunities we see and we see around, um, I think we're on a run rate to see 1,200 businesses this year. Um, but we'll invest in kind of a very small subset of those that pass both the test of, do we believe this can be 10X? And does it meet our impact mandate of being 100% um, impact embedded into the business model? So when we look at impact, um, and I think Bazaar's um, starting off was really good to get a sense of the spectrum of, of kind of different ways that you can look at impact. But what, how we view the world is that we are looking for startups that have a very clear embedded measurable metric to one of these three key themes and that's sustainable living, health and wellbeing and empowering people. It's a broad mandate for impact, um, purposefully broad because we are number one, we care a lot about, care a, a lot about a lot of different problems. Um, and number two, we are trying to prove the thesis that you can create impact while generating a financial return. And so, um, it makes sense for us to, to keep the kind of impact focus broad so that we can find enough high quality deals that meet the impact mandate while also generating a financial return and offsetting that risk I was talking about in terms of investing into venture. And so I'm going to talk about the screening criteria just in a little bit more detail before I get to an example. Um, so a couple of these you would have heard me reference just before, but the, the, the criteria for kind of meeting um, our impact mandate, we start with three very simple questions. The first one is around impact heart. And this is, the question here is, are the founders impact driven? So we, through a series of conversations with the founder, we meet the founder a number of times before we make an investment. We make an assessment as to whether they are a missionary or a mercenary. And that, um, if it, it isn't immediately evident, is missionary is is profit driven and uh, sorry missionary is mission driven, and mercenary is is profit driven. And occasionally you will come across somebody who has built a business that is doing good, but is entirely profit driven. And the problem there for us is that when you invest in companies where that is at the heart. Um, there's a lot of decisions that businesses need to make in their growth journey. And we want founders to be making the impact decision and not necessarily the easy decision. The second question is around profit and purpose lock. So this is what I was talking about when I say embedded impact. And so the profit and purpose lock basically means that every single dollar of revenue generated by the business can be immediately linked to a unit of impact being created. There's no stripping out the, the impact from the business model. There's no kind of you invest in fossil fuels and you donate a portion, to portion of that to charity. That's, that's not, um, not that kind of lock. It really is revenue linked to impact. And then the impact DNA is around asking the question of whether the impact is actually measurable. Is it direct enough that we can attribute those actions taken by the business and the dollars of revenue generated to the impact um, that we believe is being created? And so I will illustrate this with an example of GoTerra. So GoTerra is um, an incredible business that takes organic waste and processes it in shipping containers filled with maggots. And the benefits of this are incredible, gross though it may be. 
Um, maggots can process waste incredibly efficiently, incredibly sustainably. And then the, the, um, the result is that you can use those maggots to, to um, turn them into livestock feed. So they actually divert organic waste from landfill and turn it back into a useful, valuable product without the carbon emissions um, being emitted that uh, would happen if it went to landfill. And so answering those three questions for GoTerra, there was a clear impact heart. We uh, met Olympia a number of times. We founded this business and she is absolutely committed to solving this problem, which is um, an extremely substantial one when it comes to decarbonizing and reaching our climate emissions targets because food waste has a huge GHG footprint or greenhouse gas emission footprint. To the profit and purpose lock, they generate revenue from charging a waste management fee. So every single dollar of revenue generated it is actually coming from diverting that organic waste from landfill and turning it into sustainable livestock feed. There is no um, way that you can strip that out of the business model. And then finally, impact DNA. It's very easy to measure the impact because it comes out of the operational metrics of the business. They, um, they know exactly how many tons of waste they're diverting from landfill. You can very easily convert tons of waste um, using a conversion factor to carbon emissions avoided and actually measure the impact that GoTerra is having. And that is where I'll wrap things up and pass to MMI. Perfect. Thanks for that, Charlie. And really interesting to hear about those links forming as well. If you do have any questions, feel free to drop them in the Slido and we can discuss them during um, the Q&A part. Now, it's uh, my pleasure to welcome Tim and Pat from Social Ventures Australia to present. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'll just pull up my screen. Can you see that all right? It's just showing the notes section. I'll show the notes. How's that? Perfect. All right. Um, so thanks for having us. Uh, Tim and I are from uh, Social Ventures Australia, part of the Impact Investing team. Um, just a bit of background about uh, SVA. Um, let's see. So we're, we're a not-for-profit organisation and we work with partners uh, to alleviate disadvantage. Um, and that's sort of our, our vision, sort of creating an Australia where all people and communities thrive. And we do that through four different uh, business areas. One's uh, ventures, which is a range of early childhood employment and education programs. Uh, another is consulting, um, which is more of a sort of typical traditional management consulting service offering, which is tailored for um, not-for-profits, social enterprises, governments, and sort of corporates looking at sort of corporate, um, corporate social responsibility. Uh, we have a policy and advocacy team which look at sort of how we can advocate for uh, social change uh, at a government level. And then there's uh, impact investing, which is uh, Tim and myself. And so there's about 15 of us in the impact investing team. And there's um, pretty sort of four key areas. Um, one being our, our sort of upscaler area, which provides sort of hands-on advisory support for social enterprises wanting to sort of scale up and take on larger contracts and look at um, taking on external investment. Um, secondly, we've got sort of our, our funds management business, which Tim, Tim works across two of our funds and he can talk more about that. Um, thirdly, we've got a, a disability housing fund called uh, Synergis. And then lastly, we've got um, a sort of social impact bond practice, which uh, I'm a part of, and I can, I'll talk to you a bit more about that. Um, so social impact bonds are sort of, a, they're a relatively new sort of financial instrument used um, uh, to support um, 
government um, contracting. Uh, they've been around a decade um, and sort of were picked up in Australia in 2013. And so this social impact bond works where government um, enters into an outcomes contract with a service provider, being a, a not-for-profit or a social enterprise, where they pay that organisation based on the outcomes achieved um, uh, by that organisation, particular service. Um, and the social impact bond provides the working capital for that program up front. So unlike traditional sort of government funding where 100% um, of the funding is provided up front, uh, in this case, service providers only receive that funding um, where or one, once they start to achieve outcomes. And so they might only start getting people into jobs, um, you know, two years into, the, into delivering the program. Or, um, so there's a delay in, um, in terms of when they'll actually receive that funding. So the social impact bond provides um, that sort of upfront um, capital. Um, so the service provider delivers the service to the service users. Um, and then that, that hopefully delivers improved outcomes and savings to government. And then based on the measurement of those outcomes, government pays um, on those outcomes and, and um, that in turn results in a um, payment to investors. Um, and so on the flip side, if, if performance doesn't go that, that well, investors sort of share that, um, share that risk uh, and um, you know, that they, um, yeah, wear, wear some of that loss with the service provider. So that's a bit of an overview. Uh, in terms of the, the process, it's, it's largely a, a government-led uh, process in terms of um, creating these, these instruments. Uh, government comes out with a tender for a particular, uh, seeking um, proposals for particular interventions to address certain social issues. Um, service providers in not-for-profits and social enterprises respond. We often help them developing a proposal um, to respond to that. Then once that proposal is um, accepted by government, uh, then uh, enter into sort of this, what we call a joint development phase where we negotiate the, um, the sort of all the commercial terms with government and how the, the service will work, how the contract will work, what are the outcomes they're gonna be paid on. Um, and, and so then once that's all locked in mind, then uh, SVA then goes to market with uh, the investment opportunity and sort of um, takes that to potential uh, investors and, um, and we uh, raise the capital required for the social impact bond. And then we enter, once that's all done, then program sets up and the service delivery uh, goes on for a number of years. So it, it can take a little while to set one of these um, social impact bonds up and that's, because of, because of that, and because it's a government-led um, initiative, is is that that's why there's not a huge amount of them around. So currently in Australia, there's 21 outcomes-based contracts, including 14 social impact bonds. Um, so all across Australia, well, not in Western Australia or NT or Tasmania yet, but um, uh, sort of New South Wales has led the way. But Victoria's recently um, implemented four of them, uh, which has been great. Uh, and the Commonwealth has also been looking at it. Um, and so most of the contract, most of the, the SIBs are still live and, and operating. Uh, only a couple have sort of finished the tenure and, and a few, unfortunately, have, have terminated early because um, it did not go uh, as planned. Um, I'll just dive into one of them as an example. So the Aspire Social Impact Bond um, is Australia's first homelessness focus SIP. Uh, so that works directly with people um, experiencing chronic homelessness in uh, Metropolitan Adelaide. So we work with our service delivery partner, Hutt Street Centre, who's on the ground providing the service. Um, and so the South Australian government is the ultimate sort of funder of the outcomes. Um, so it works with um, people experiencing homelessness instead of placing them into a house and then providing them with the sustained wraparound support they need to, um, to engage with the community, to engage in employment or education. Uh, and so currently that's working with 575 people uh, in Adelaide. Um, and that the specific outcomes that the, the program 
is measured on and investors ultimately get paid um, on is sort of the reduction in um, hospital bed days. So reduction in the time um, this cohort spends uh, in hospital, as well as reduced number of convictions and reduced um, usage of uh, emergency accommodation. Uh, and so the overall term of the, the SIB is uh, almost eight years. We're four, four years into it and the program is tracking really well in terms of its performance. It's um, measured a 38% reduction in hospital bed days, 46% reduction in convictions, uh, and a 71% reduction in accommodation periods. And that's all sort of, rel um, that reduction is relative to uh, a similar um, group of people experiencing homelessness. Um, on a historic basis, which um, haven't engaged in a service like this. Uh, and in terms of investor returns, uh, currently it's because of the way it's tracking, it's projecting a 12.8% uh, uh, return per annum, um, which seems quite high. It was originally targeting 8.5%. Um, not all social impact bonds like this. This is one of the, one of a um, few really, really great success stories. Some of them have resulted in you know, investors losing money um, but generally, uh, the ones which have gone to market the last, um, with that we've gone to market with in the last few years have sort of been around the, the six to seven percent um, uh, return per year. So I'll just hand over to Tim now. Thanks, Pat. Hi, everyone. Um, it's great, great to be with you tonight. I'm uh, tuning in from Brisbane. Uh, I started started with SVA back in March last year had uh, one day in the Melbourne office and have been working from Brisbane ever since. So um, yeah, I hope everyone's going well, wherever you are. And um, yeah, really um, uh, feel for all the people at the moment in, in lockdown, I hope everyone's going well. Okay, so um, this, this first slide um, just provides a, a nice, simple, uh, kind of high level overview of SBA's impact investing operations. Uh, you can get a good sense of the, the type of capital that we deploy, uh, the, the scale or quantum of the, the capital we're deploying, and, and, and our kind of two uh, core objectives there, both uh, the generation of positive social impact uh, alongside uh, financial return. Uh, so it's, it's in, in this context that uh, SBA is involved in uh, three, three funds, uh, with uh, in excess of a uh, $100 million uh, un, uh, funds under management. Uh, so the, the first fund um, was, was the one um, Pat mentioned, so the Synergist Fund. Uh, this fund is a, a joint venture uh, with Federation Asset Management. And this, this fund's focused on owning uh, the this, this specialist disability accommodation. Uh, so um, the, the other two funds, we've got... Um, a $15 million diversified impact fund, uh, and then a, a much larger institutional investment mandate uh, with HESTA, uh, known as the Social Impact Investment Trust. And, and there's a number of kind of commonalities between those two funds. Um, they're basically both making kind of um, equity uh, and debt investments and, and pretty much everything in between. So a number of different kind of hybrid structures uh, including kind of uh, mezzanine, mezzanine financing investments. Uh, so I, I might zoom in just on, on the diversified impact fund, uh, which, which is the fund I, I work with most closely, uh, and just outline a couple of the kind of features of, of that fund. Uh, so as I said, $15 million uh, under management in this fund. It's a, a 10 year uh, closed end fund uh, with a, a five year uh, investment period. Um, it was open to wholesale investors. Uh, it has an interesting uh, or innovative uh, downside protection, which is equal to 20% uh, of the capital commitments, uh, and that's uh, provided via a, uh, a PAF, PAF structure. Uh, so the, the fund, as said, debt, equity, everything in between, um, and um, actually, Pat, if you're able just to, yeah, yeah. Um, th this slide, I suppose, gives you a, a nice overview of, of the kind of investment themes that we're looking at across all our funds. 
um, and, and how this is translated into specific investments in the, the Diversified Impact Fund. Um, I, I can kind of step through some of our kind of existing um, investments in our portfolio. So uh, we've, we've made a number of investments in the Diversified Impact Fund into um, social impact bonds, as, as Pat just outlined. Um, we've made uh, a relatively early stage equity investment into an ed tech business called Mass Pathway. Uh, we've made a number of sub subordinated uh, debt investments into Nightingale uh, developments focused on uh, affordable housing. Um, we've also made an investment into that, the Synergist Fund, as, as I mentioned before. Um, and, and most recently, we've made a, a subordinated debt or mezzanine um, investment into a, a specialist disability accommodation project in, in Sydney. So as the name suggests, quite a diverse uh, portfolio of investments. Uh, and I suppose just reflecting briefly on, on some of the key things that we look for. Um, and it, it's been great to hear from um, both Baza Capital and also um, from Charlie from Giant Leap. And there's a lot of great kind of content there to kind of reflect on and think through. Um, I suppose at a, at a very high level, one of the ways that we kind of uh, measure our social impact. So we're mapping um, in our annual report um, our impact relative to the, the UN uh, SDGs. Um, but I suppose each individual investment, um, the, the impact that's generated uh, is, is unique. And, and so in assessing each of those um, impact investments, uh, we have a very kind of bespoke approach. Um, and that's uh, kind of um, discussed and, and um, uh, yeah, through, through our various kind of um, internal kind of team meetings, but also when we take it to the investment committee level. Um, so uh, a couple of other just um, points to mention. So um, we're, we're not at kind of the, the really early kind of seed stage. Um, we, we, we have some flexibility in, in the stage of company we've invested in, but typically we're looking for some traction in revenues. So around that kind of half a million dollars of, of revenues or up to kind of a million. Um, and social impact is kind of focused in Australia. So that can be kind of a product or service that is uh, helping um, people experiencing disadvantage in Australia. Um, it could be a headquarters in, in Australia. Um, there's a, a bit of flexibility in terms of um, that aspect. Um, as, as um, some of the previous speakers have mentioned, um, we're, we're really focused on understanding the founders um, and their motivation, um, so their connection to the social issue that they're trying to um, uh, help um, is, is always a, a really interesting, um, um, interesting thing to kind of talk through with the founders and, and you really get a sense of their passion and, and um, really wanting to drive social impact. So that's something we really um, spend a lot of time focused on. Uh, and then the, the typical kind of commercially viable model. So understanding their kind of track record in terms of the finances, um, understanding whether they've got a, a defensible um, business model. Um, and that's, that's kind of, I suppose, just a very quick snapshot of some of the things we consider. Um, and Pat, feel free to, um, move through to that final slide. Uh, this slide um, just gives a, a bit of a, a summary of some of the investments we've made across each of those impact investment themes. Um, so uh, in terms of education, the Good Start Early Learning uh, deal, so quite a, a large scale investment um, that um, we will probably uh, investigate further as the night goes, goes on. Um, we've also made uh, that investment through the Social Impact Investment Trust in the Glenview project. Uh, uh, so kind of an incubator role with, with First Australians Capital uh, and then various kind of housing and employment deals there as well. So happy to kind of take questions on any of those um, as we progress. So thanks very much. Great. Thanks very much for that, Tim and Pat. Um, really, really insightful there. So we're just going to move now into a broader um, panel session. So people have been asking a bunch of questions in Q&A. Um, but first, quickly, I'll just 
um, give a bit of a precursor to the case activity that is coming up. So we've allocated every single attendee into a room there. So we'll just have this on for a few seconds. It'd be great if you could just note down what team you've been allocated to. And then after the panel session wraps up, um, just feel free to hop into that breakout room. We'll give you some more instructions then. Um, and this will also be put up afterwards as well. But on that note, we'll transition into the panel section. So we're um, very fortunate to have um, everyone sticking around for a few more minutes and the QR code there will take you to the slider where you can direct any additional questions. But I guess I just wanted to start off. We've received a lot of queries about how people get into impact investing. And what we've seen tonight is, um, <laughs> I know Bazi, you don't refer to yourself strictly as impact investors, but I think that field of finance as well as impact um, is really intriguing to a lot of students particularly. So could we maybe just um, go around starting in the same order? So starting at Baza, then Giant Leap, and then SBA, maybe a quick introduction into what you were doing beforehand, how you came into impact um, investing, and then are there any little bits of advice you'd say um, for anyone that's keen on the area? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. So uh, Braden and I both started in investment banking, so, so corporate advisory, and they actually gave us a really good grounding for understanding the full spectrum of markets, um, investment advisory and, and, and other aspects. Um, in terms of the ESG aspect, it really does come down to your personal values in my view. Um, these are both things that Braden and I are extremely passionate about and that's what's brought us to starting um, a funds management business which, which has a focus on responsible investment. Um, and so I would just, uh, um, I recommend that people nurture that interest and, and passion. Um, I got really um, interested in, you know, well, and concerned about climate change, and so really got up the curve on renewable energy and, and others that we can we can move forward towards a zero carbon future. Um, the other thing that you can do, which um, because there, it is a growing industry, but um, places are limited for now. I actually did some volunteer work, so. Um, the climate change think tank um, beyond zero emissions they were taking on volunteer researchers so I went and did some work with them so any way that you can really nurture that interest and and, and show that you're really genuine about it is, is a great way to go um, and then just on the risk return side the finance side it's really just about getting into um, you know kind of the traditional things investment banking funds management um, and, and the like I'll probably yeah. on to the next. Great, great, great advice there, Will. I, I, so I wouldn't follow my path um, if, I was, if I was you. I came into impact investing um, very much through the, uh, following my nose in terms of who was most exciting to me. I realized very quickly that founders were most exciting to me. I started working with founders in a very small consultancy doing um, very early stage growth consulting. So rolling our sleeves up and basically building landing pages, doing social media ads, anything founders needed us to. And while I was doing my MBA, I was very fortunate to come across Giant Leap as um, a way to do exactly what I wanted to do, but with a bit of a better business model, which is being on the other side of the equation and actually putting money into the startup ecosystem rather than trying to consult into it and take it out of the ecosystem. So I... Um, I would say that I am an impact convert, not an impact champion um, in terms of my journey to impact. But within six months, I knew it was exactly the thing that I wanted to do, not just for the next five years, but the next 40 years. I am absolutely um, sold on, uh, on everything about it. I think the, the, the thing that I realize and, and is different for all of you than it was for me is that I partially attribute the fact that I didn't know about impact uh, when I started at Giant Leap to the fact that it wasn't actually talked about that much. And in the last four years, it's gone from being kind of a niche conversation to being a very um, real conversation that not just impact managers are having, but, you know, Baza, I think your, your testament to the fact that everybody is having this conversation. Every company is talking about ESG. They're talking about wanting to be on the right side of history. They're wanting to be on, on the right side of their morals. So I think now more than ever, there are so many more opportunities to take a better path than I did. Um, I think the, the uh, 
couple of tips that I would have uh, impact venture capital specifically is that um, the impact ecosystem is, or rather the startup ecosystem in which the impact VC fund um, system is a subsegment, is a very networks driven um, set of organizations. And there's also um, a whole lot of ways that you can be involved and get into that network. So things like not just, you know, applying to impact VC funds like SDA, they do amazing work. I highly recommend um, Giant Leap. There's now kind of um, a, a whole new generation of impact funds in um, main sequence is doing amazing work in venture. Um, there's a number of funds raising at the moment. Um, so absolutely go for those opportunities, but also just be involved in impact startups. If you're interested in impact VC, there are so many impact startups, as I mentioned, 20% of Australian startups cast our test and admittedly that's you know, our, um, our test, but it's a large proportion. And so working for a, a startup that has a real uh, impact mission will be a fast track kind of into that network. And if you want to be in impact VC, it's also incredibly valuable experience to VCs in general. Operational experience is top notch for, um, for getting into impact VC and having a real value to add. And I'll pass to Pat or Tim, whoever wants to talk on SDA's behalf. Yeah, I'm more than happy. Um, yeah, I've got uh, quite a, a different background as well. Um, some similarities though. I, I started off in um, private equity corporate advisory. And I, I think um, as, as William mentioned, um, for me that gave me some, some really core skills around um, yeah, evaluating different um, investment opportunities and some of the, just the basics around um, uh, valuation, understanding how to read a, a balance sheet, um, income statement, um, all, all those kind of things, how to structure an investment paper. Um, I, I then kind of moved, um, I was doing a lot of volunteer work um, at, at that time, particularly around um, uh, helping uh, asylum seekers and refugees. Um, I did some kind of overseas travel as well, um, worked, worked with a church for two years, uh, and then kind of brought together all those different experiences in a finance, finance PhD, um, looking at impact investments. So um, once I finished that, um, yeah, I was, I was really keen to kind of uh, jump into this role with SBA. And as Charlie mentioned, yeah, I, it's, a, it's such a great area. Um, you have the opportunity to, to really positively impact the lives uh, of people. And, and I think that's just, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a great, great thing to come to each day. Right. Thank you very much for that, everyone. I think a core theme that's emerged from that chat as well as just throughout the night was the fact that impact investing and that mindset's becoming a lot more mainstream. It's a conversation that's constantly been had. But I think one of the concerns um, from a lot of consumers as well, um, as people looking at the space, is that idea of greenwashing and people perhaps overselling achievements and I guess advertising has been impact driven, but not actually creating or not actually um, being good for society. So I suppose in your eyes, do you see there being the potential development of say a standardized set of criteria when it comes to these negative or positive screens? Um, maybe starting, yep, starting with Barza and then SVA and whoever wants to contribute. Yeah, great, I'll start and Braden, just let me know if you want to say anything here. Um, I think this is a really, really important point. And, and this, is, this is why uh, we, we wanted to get across that we're a bit different to, to Giant Leap and SVA, but really it's about for us, business as usual should be ESG oriented, whether it's impact or whether it's making sure you're not investing in bad things or, you know, or, or various other iterations that it can take. And so we, we don't usually, we're not, we're not saying, you know, we're, we're out there kind of doing all these wonderful things. We're just saying this is business as usual and this is how it should be and, and, and let's get on with it. Um, in, terms of, in terms of measurable objectives, it, it really will come down to the investor in, in these various funds in the end. So it, it, it will be driven by that. I, I think it could be fair that we will have certain definitions that will require and, and accreditations will require certain metrics or, or certain thresholds. 
but in the end it's driven by the person who's bringing the capital and and it's what they will want to um you know kind of their their thresholds and so we just want to be really transparent about what our thresholds are what we're passionate about investing in and not investing in and then people can make up their own mind as to whether you know where the fund for them um but certainly seeing a, a real groundswell towards people concentrating on this more yeah, and, and, and probably just on that standardization piece, we think certainly from what we've seen, <clears throat> um, there's really poor standardization, you know, whether you're looking at, um, you know, if you just wanted to pick up and, you know, and, and, and have a look at some of the biggest ASX companies and you can access a few free um, like ESG ratings and reports, you'll get wildly different results depending on the brand or the research provider that's providing it. So there's there really isn't great standardization and 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 that is holding the industry back significantly. I think there's a lot of um, like a lot of smart people trying to figure out how do we best standardize, um, particularly where it's standardization of um, kind of data that isn't pure quantitative <clears throat> and you're having to make more qualitative assessments. So the industry is grappling with it. And I'd say it's in a very early stage. It is probably going to be the biggest change, I'd say, over the next kind of <clears throat> five to 10 years if there does become quite good standardization of, you know, this is the reporting metrics for all companies. Um, and you start to see that getting pushed out. I think that like that in itself would be a great help for a lot of investors, whether they have you know, super detailed automated ESG processes, just looking to get to speed and to make their own investing decision. And I just want to touch, sorry, well, we won't take much longer, but just the, the term greenwashing as well. So I think, yeah, that's that's really important and it's, it's a hot topic at the moment. And I really liked the points um, from the impact investment um, in Giant Leap where it's really, you want to concentrate on revenue and the impact that's coming from the revenue, not people who are doing bad things with their revenue and then paying it away their costs um but having said that we do want to have everyone move towards a better you know future and so we also we we also stop short of being too kind of skeptical or too kind of uh, you know, argumentative against people who are moving towards doing the right thing. There are going to be some people who trip over themselves on the way, but as long as we're moving in the right direction, that's that's the the absolute key aspect. Yeah, I I, I think the 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 big impact of intent being one of the drivers of how you assess whether an investor, so talking, talking just about investors rather than greenwashing from companies, because certainly there's, there's issues with both. Um, but yeah, for, for investors, there's, um, a whole, there's a massive role of intent um, that plays into things. And just to talk to a couple of the uh, efforts that are being made towards standardization, I think you can group, standardization's a big word, and I think you can group, um, group it into a couple of things into kind of standardization of goals and standardization of approach. And there are um, those standards available. So I think SVA touched on the fact that they map to the SDGs, the UN's SDGs. They actually do have goals that are um, published on the, on the website and fairly available. And so it's quite easy if somebody says they're mapping to the SDGs to, to look at, okay, well, what goal are you actually contributing to? Um, so that's one, one tool that it's important for investors to understand and, and to communicate kind of how exactly they are contributing to the goals that they say they're contributing to. And the other is around the, um, around the approach and the how they, um, they are contributing to impact. And there are, this is where it gets a little bit tricky, but there has been a really strong effort from one particular organization called the Impact Management Project, which I'm sure um, the other panelists will be familiar with. But basically, the Impact Management Project has brought together thousands of impact investors to try and get on the same page with language because they realize that standard language is a problem and standardization is necessary to drive 
um, the conversation forward and avoid this problem of greenwashing. And so the impact management project um, encourages investors to ask themselves five key questions or, or questions in five key areas around kind of what the impact is, um, who are the beneficiaries, how much the, the, um, the investment will impact the beneficiaries, the contribution of if this investment didn't exist, you know, what, like what, what contribution is it having additional to what is currently in existence? And then also asking questions about unintended consequences. And that hopefully for investors um, gets them to understand more about the depth of impact and being able to compare, okay, well, if I'm investing in, you know, something that reduces textile waste against something that, um, you know, provides education for un an underserved population, helps them to at least benchmark um, how that rates against uh, the impact management projects questions and, and where to focus their investment for the highest potential impact. Cool. Um, we might just wrap up with one more question um, and then move on to the case activity. And this might be a bit of a controversial, maybe like picking a favorite child, but is there a particular investment in a company that uh, that you guys have particularly enjoyed, Some, a company, say your favorite one that stood out, whether that be what they've done, the industry they operate in or how they've performed? Maybe kicking off with SVA or whoever comes up with something first. Uh, you want to go, uh, you go, Charlie? <laughs> no, but if you want to, if you want to go, I was going to say I'm going to avoid this question by saying what the most recent one is because <laughs> you cannot pick your favorite child. We've invested in over 20 companies and and we love them all equally. Um, so the most most recent one that we invested in that I am genuinely really excited about is Who Gives a Crap Toilet Paper. So they, if I'm sure some people have heard of them. I'm sure some people probably have them like I do sitting in their bathroom with the lovely um, aesthetic packaging of their toilet rolls. But basically they go, they, they were at the vanguard of what social impact, a social impact startup means. And they over nine years have proven that you can, um, so their business model is that they donate a portion of their profits to charity. Um, but even with that kind of additional cost to the business and, um, and that being a potential drag on, on the unit economics of the business or rather the growth potential of the business, it's absolutely proven um, in their growth that social impact is actually a drag. It's a driver of growth potential and they've uh, attracted investment from not just Giant Leap, but also mainstream venture capital that doesn't have an impact mandate, um, such as Airtree and, and some others. So just really excited to, to be invested in them because they, they were really, you know, one of the first um, uh, impact startups to prove that and actually were an inspiration for Giant Leap as well. Over to you, Pat. Sure. Thanks, Charlie. Um, so the, the seed investments are st structured slightly different, but I guess from my perspective, the favourite one, it's been a recent one as well, is um, uh, it's called the New Pin South Australia Social Impact Bond, and um, it's a program working with um, families where the, the children have gone into out-of-home care and it works to um, restore the child back to the care of the parents where it's um, safe and appropriate to do so. Um, and it's delivered by a not-for-profit called Uniting Communities and um, they're working closely with the South Australian Department of Child Protection on that one. Um, and yeah, I guess it's a favourite in terms of just it's a really high level of impact, you know, providing an opportunity for uh, really disadvantaged families to um, come back together um, when... Um, Unfortunately, life circumstances might be um, really difficult uh, for the parents, um, but also the the nature of the, the partnership between ourselves, United Communities, and um, the South Australian government has been really strong and, and positive, and everyone's just been focused on the the end goal of of the the children and the families um, 
that the, the funding is, is supporting. Um, and that's, yeah, made it just really uh, enjoyable to, to work, um, work on. Nice one. Um, yeah, so one for us, actually one of our very first investments um, early, early last year, uh, something called Vulcan Energy. So something that's not widely known, it's becoming better known, is that mining lithium is actually a really carbon intensive process, as well as then refining that lithium and, and, and converting it to batteries, and then obviously putting that into cars, electric vehicles, and, and, and other items that use those batteries. So people started to become a lot more cognizant of this, um, especially car makers. And so they're trying to zero carbon their entire supply chain, not just the end product. Um, and so there's Vulcan Energy have looked to do zero carbon lithium. And so what they're doing is they're bolting onto a, a geothermal system in Germany, uh, which happens to have reasonable lithium grades. And so they've got zero carbon energy coming from the geothermal, they're refining the brines into lithium and then they're plugging that straight to the European um, auto manufacturers. Um, and so we, we've made several investments directly to this company's balance sheet along their journey. Um, they're currently very successful and, and, and kind of developing this project. And yeah, it's just, a, it's just a great one because it really does have that purity of um, the zero that we're looking for. Cool. Um, Tim or Braden, any other ones? Otherwise, we can um, wrap up there. No, I'd have, have to agree with Pat. I, I think I, I love the work of both Pat and Elise in our SIB team. I, I think, um, yeah, it's amazing to, to kind of um, dig into the structure and understanding kind of how the, the social impact and the financial return is all kind of tied together in those structures. So, um, yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much for that panel session, everyone uh, in attendance today. Um, really appreciate all of the insights and I'm sure everyone in attendance um, really enjoyed, I guess, the different angles that everyone took. So now we'll just be moving into the case activity. So it's also my pleasure to introduce Lisa um, Fedorenko from Albert's Impact Capital. Um, so she'll be joining us for this program as well, one of the big other VC. And thank you to um, the bars of representatives and also the analyst um, Victoria for joining us this evening. Um, thank you for your contributions and um, I'm sure we'll be collaborating in the future. So thanks, yeah. thanks Angus and team. See you later. Thanks everyone. Good night. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I guess Lisa, would you like to just give a quick introduction? Sure. Um, so my background, uh, I've been an investor for a bit over a decade. Um, started my, uh, when I was at uni, I studied uh, advanced maths, computer science and econometrics, so all the nerdy ones. Um, I started off my career um, in uh, Credit Suisse on the trading floor in equity research sales before uh, switching to the buy side at a hedge fund called Montgomery Investment Management and then moving up and up the risk curve towards venture capital and earlier and earlier stage companies. Um, and I've been with Alberts uh, from the start of this year, working on their um, Impact Ventures Fund. Um, the Alberts have a longer history of 137 years. So they've been in business for, um, they're now their fifth generation. Um, and we invest in four key theme areas. One's environment and sustainability. Um, one is mental health and wellbeing. One is arts, music, entertainment. And the last one's equality. Um, and we collaborated a fair bit with Giant Leap, so um, Charlie's a pretty familiar face over there. <laughs> Great, thank you for that. So it's now time we'll just move on to the case activity. So everyone would have been allocated a room here. Um, I think my events team, they should have opened up breakout rooms. So effectively down the bottom of your screen in between record and react, there should be a little square button. Um, that says breakout room. So it'd be great if you could just place yourselves into the one that you've been allocated to here. Um, for the uh, case facilitators, so Pat, Tim, Charlie and Lisa, um, they'll just be floating around each of the rooms 
Um, there'll be also be an MMI representative um, in all of them to guide you along. Uh, the case should have just been dropped. Um, otherwise, that will also be dropped by each of the case facilitators in every room. But yep, it'd be great if everyone could start hopping into their breakout rooms now and we'll be with you soon.